so welcome everyone. Uh, today we wanted to talk about basement renovations and uh, we're gonna go through quite a lot of information so this is gonna be a very very information rich uh, presentation so we're gonna go through the top 10 tips for your future basement renovation tip number one figure out your needs and your budget this is the tip number one and of course the most important thing is to first understand what do you need and what do you want with the basement it's very important to also understand the budget so let's go through that so first thing first is let's split your basement renovations in two. One is going to be for personal use, one is going to be for rental purposes. A lot of the clients, a lot of the people that we work with want to rent out the basement for income properties and the separate clientele wants to, of course to use it for personal use, for entertainment purposes, uh, some want it for um, an office, additional office space. Uh, with COVID a lot of kids uh, go to school from home, a lot of people work from home. So I wanted to talk a little bit about um, important things to add into to the basement depending on what you're doing. So if you're building a basement apartment, of course number one is adding a bedroom. So that's, that's, a, that's a go. Uh, number two is adding a laundry in a separate room. So a lot of the times what's attractive to the tenants is making sure that the laundry is in a separate room to make sure there is space for folding, space for ironing. But if you don't have enough space, of course you can put it into the closet. And we'll walk you through the designs with the next steps so you guys will understand what we're talking about. Um, the more closet space, the better. This is going to be their only livable, livable space. So working with your designer to make sure that you can place as many closets as possible is going to be definitely beneficial. Um, now let's talk about the bathroom. So you're going to have two options. If you want to attract families and if you want to attract the most amount of people, I do recommend placing a bathtub in the bathroom. The reason why if someone has pets or if someone has a little kid, it's much more attractive to have a bathtub there versus a shower. If you want to not attract the clientele with, with, um, with kids, if you want a younger dream demographic, definitely shower cur uh, currently is a much more, much more popular option. Um, shower for younger demographic and spacious kitchens is one of the important ones as well. A lot of the clients we see making mistakes putting too small of a kitchen. If you put too small of a kitchen, you're not going to be able to attract anyone. It's not going to be popular. It's not going to be attractive to the renters. Double sink vanity. Double sink vanity is also very important. The reason why double sink vanity is important, if you're going to be renting to a family, um, it's a great thing to have two sinks to make sure that when they're getting ready for work, when they're getting ready to get out, um, they have um, two places where they can get ready at the same time. For personal use, I'm going to go over it quickly, but basically a room is important. A three-piece bathroom will definitely increase the value of your house. So whether it's just for you not to be able to go upstairs and just stay in the basement, or if it's just for resale value, adding a three-piece bathroom is a great option. Unfinished storage is, to be honest, probably one of the biggest mistakes that I see. Um, in terms of unfinished storage, we have a rule of thumb in our company. I always say, if your house is about 10, let's say 3,000 square feet, take 10% of that space and keep that as unfinished storage. Um, if you finish every single square foot of your basement, what's going to happen is where is all that Christmas stuff going to go? Where is all that Halloween stuff is going to go? Where is all your boxes going to go? Where is your luggage going to go? So a lot of the times you see a very nicely finished basement and then your garage is full of stuff and now you can't park your cars. So definitely also this will lower the cost of the basement renovation because you're also finishing way less space. So that's also a great advantage. Um, next things that are popular is going to be bars and axe and walls. So this is actually where people will spend their money. And the reason why it's an accent piece, and this is a showpiece of your basement. Not a lot of people will splurge a lot of money on fancy faucetry or fancy tile in the bathroom just because it's a basement bathroom. They'll do that upstairs with a master bathroom. But they will definitely do that with an accent wall in a bar just because, again, it's a showpiece, it's an accent piece. Home theater uh, with COVID and lockdowns has become a little bit more popular nowadays. So home theater, uh, you can use it as a separate room or as a home theater. We'll talk about soundproofing solutions in a second as well. And uh, we do see an inflation of requests for saunas and steam steam rooms right now for dry sauna you will need a separate space and for a steam room the beautiful thing is you can take a shower that we're going to be building or someone is a contractor is going to be building for you and we can use that steam room and sorry we can use that shower convert it to a steam room so there's special steam room units that you can put in the unfinished area you can route the mechanical to the shower and now your shower is two in one let's talk about basement cause this is probably why everyone is here today 
So the base cost of the basement renovation, you're probably looking at the neighborhood of uh, 40 to $70 per square foot. Unfortunately, it's not linear. The bigger the space, the lower the cost of the basement renovation is going to be. So if you have a 400, 500 square foot basement, of course, the cost per square foot to finish even the base, just the walls and the floors is gonna be higher than a 1500 square foot basement. So take a look at that first. Once you take that as a base price, um, and consult with your contractor, call a couple of contractors to get some pricing. It's very important. Let's start adding some things. If you want to add a room, you're looking two to 3,000. If you're looking at a closet, and add another 1,000 to 2,000 um, dollars. If you're looking at a powder room, add another 5,000 dollars to the cost. Three-piece bathroom, depending on the materials you're going to be using, if you, depending if you're going to be doing a tub, if you're doing a, a shower, a custom shower, you're looking at another 10 to 12,000. Laundry, you're looking at about three to 5,000. The difference there is gonna depend. Are you gonna be putting in the open area? Do you wanna put in a closet with a stackable laundry? Do you wanna create a separate area, a separate room for the laundry with tiling on the floor? Or do you wanna run vinyl throughout? So this will change the pricing a little bit here and there. The steam room, depending on the unit itself, you're gonna be looking at five to $10,000 to add on to the actual cost of the shower. The sauna, again, depending on the size, you're looking at about twelve to 20,000. It's gonna depend on how big is gonna be the sauna. Do you want floating shelves? Do you want L benches? Do you want two layered L benches? One layer L benches? What sort of machine do you want? Do you want a fancy steamer? Do you want a fancy uh, heater or a regular heater? There's, there's, there's actually units with steam rooms where you can have Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and music, and all these fancy things. So it's really gonna depend on you. Um, the only thing that I would strongly encourage is not to make the sauna too small if you are building the sauna. There's some contractors that will sell you a three by five sauna. That's definitely not functional. I, I would recommend, let's say for people, uh, four, six by seven feet sauna would be functional. Um, accent walls and kitchens and bars, let's talk about that. So bar 5,000 plus. Why I say 5,000 plus is because there's really no upper limit. Um, the reason why is the sky is the limit. You could make it very custom. You could make it very high end. There's a lot of different types of materials. There's a lot of different types of finishes that you can use. And depending on that, of course, the pricing is gonna change. Kitchen, the same thing. The reason why it's more expensive is because you need more space. There's also a little bit more mechanical going on with the kitchen. Accent walls, 1,500 to 5,000, to be honest, is the average cost of the accent wall. Oh, look at that. The actual Renaducky themselves is here. <laughs> so, if any kids want to take a picture with a Renaducky, that would be amazing too. Renaducky brought me the floors. Thank you, Renaducky. This will be for later. So, in regards to accent walls, 1500 to 5000 is the average cost of what people would spend. <clears throat> on the actual accent wall. Having said that, I've built accent walls as cheap as $300, just paint the wall, to as expensive as $15,000. Fancy fireplaces, fancy stonework, cabinetry work, mill work, et cetera, et cetera. So everything is gonna go back to the budget and we always tell our clients, what are the most valuable things that we can do considering your budgets? This is very important to find a good contractor who will help you navigate that. Um, separate entrance, for those who want to do a legal basement apartment for rental purposes, um, separate entrance will cost anywhere between ten dollars and $30,000. It's a big cost. You're dealing with the structure of the house and it's going to depend whether you just need to cut a door somewhere at the same level or if you need to dig down, how low do you need to dig down? Are you going to be digging down at the side of the house? Are you going to be going inwards to the basement? So all of those things are going to affect the cost of the separate entrance. And demolition, if your basement is currently finished, depending on what's inside of the basement, your demo cost is gonna be between three and seven dollars per square foot. Also, of course, that cost is gonna change slightly depending on the size of the basement too. Again, it's not linear, consult with your contractor, they're gonna be able to help you out. Tip number two, avoid layout mistakes. Now we're getting into the fun part. So I always say make sure you maximize the open concept. So this is very important. If you take a look over here, what we did is, um, I'm hearing tons of feedback, but basically what we did over here is you can see as you're moving down from the stairs, in both scenarios, you're hitting the open concept area, which is very important. If you're going down and you're seeing a wall, that's not gonna be that attractive. So make sure that you put your bathrooms, your bedrooms, and everything to the sides, 
and create as much of open concept as possible. Over there on the right, top left, by the way, you can see it says office slash den. So you can also play with, with, the, um, with the ideas of walls and create sort of little nooks. So that space, for example, I know this basement, um, it was too small for a bathroom, so we couldn't tuck in the bathroom there. But we did. We were able to create the location for a little den, for a small desk, for a little, for a little bit of extra space. This is another great example. So you can see that we placed all the bedrooms, all the bathrooms, all the gym areas, all the laundries to the sides. And in the blue, you can see that everything is shown as open area. Again, as you're going to walk down, you want as much open concept as possible. You really don't want to create a hallway to a bunch of rooms. Remember, you're paying top dollars to finish the basement. You need to make sure that it's functional. If it's not functional, you're basically wasting money. Imagine if you're investing you know, $50,000 to finish your basement and only 80% of that space is functional, well, you wasted the money because the cost per square foot just went up because you're not using 20% of the space. Add a room, but only if you can. This is really important for small basements. Let's say if you guys live in Toronto, if we're talking about East York locations, 100-year-old houses, we're looking at two very small basements. I believe both of them are in the neighborhood of 400 square feet, 450 square feet. Depending on your needs and your wants, in one basement we were able to fit a room, in the second basement we were not. And as you can see, I actually created a little layout with red showing what would an average room size look like in that basement. And no matter where we put it, it's just going to destroy the layout completely. So don't be afraid to leave it as open concept or play around with, with again, your needs and wants. And depending on that, you can, adjust, you can adjust the layout. You can work with your contractor, you can work with your designer. Add a three-piece bathroom. Three-piece bathroom is definitely um, one of the best returns on the, on the investment in the basement. The reason why is because, again, you put a check mark for resale value. Um, you're also going to be able to use it if you have guests staying over in the basement. Um, then they don't have to go upstairs and share a bathroom with you. That's also important. Two main configurations with three-piece bathrooms is sort of linear, as you can see on the left, and l shape as you can see on the right. A couple of things in terms of sizing, make sure your basement again, sorry, your bathroom is not smaller than five by eight. If you're looking at configuration on the left, typically your shower will take about three feet, so 36 inches, your toilet will take 30, and that leaves you for 30 inches with a vanity. If you want a bigger vanity, you gotta make sure that you extend that bathroom. So you can see over here we have a nine foot long um, bathroom. We'll probably be able to put a bigger vanity in that space or have a little bit more clearance between the units. On the right over here, this is a perfect example of an L shape. It's a bigger one. It's about 10 by 7. Having said that, you can shrink it down by about a couple of feet, so you can make it as small as 6.5 by 7 feet, give or take. Um, one of the important things is when you're designing, if possible, by, by all means, make sure that when you open the door, you don't open the door to the toilet. So over here, when you're opening the door, you're going to be seeing the vanity in the mirror, so it's going to look great. Over here, you're going to be opening the door. You're going to be seeing the shower. It's going to look great. Sometimes you can't avoid it, but if you can avoid it, make sure you don't open up the door and you see the toilet. It's not really attractive. If not enough space, add a powder room. This is, again, a quick just uh, recap of the powder room and sort of the configurations of the powder room. Um, you could make it either a square or you could make it uh, long and narrow. If it's a square, it's just one in front of the other, sorry, one next to the other. And then if it's uh, a long rectangle, one in front of the other. One is 5 by 5 feet, the other one is 3 by 7. And again, you could make it as big as you want, but this is the minimal configuration sizes. Also, another thing is, you know when you buy a house, and especially a new house, you see those roughens, you see those drains, those black pipes coming out of the floor, and people think that the bathrooms need to go there? Well, the answer is no, they don't really need to go there. So um, they can go wherever you want. Well, theoretically, there are some limitations. Having said that, majority of the times we can work around them. In this particular basement, the original roughens were actually there. Um, we placed a kitchen there, so we placed a bar slash kitchen over there. This was a legal basement apartment for rental. So, Professional plumbers can relocate, break the concrete, and create those roughens. So the idea of the roughens is not really to place that bathroom there, it's to minimize the cost of the plumbing relocation to you when you're finishing the basement. Uh, but I always say don't sacrifice one or two or three thousand dollars for a good layout of the basement. 
So that's why, for example, over here, you can see that everything became, again, going back to it, open concept, open concept area. So if we were to place the bathroom instead of the kitchen over there, it would block off the area completely. Also, you can see where the new location of the bathroom is. That would create, they didn't need two bedrooms. They only wanted one bedroom. That would create, actually, too much space for one bedroom. The bedroom would be too big. So it's a waste of space again. So this is just a proper way of playing with the spacing and playing, playing with the layouts. Kitchen, remember we spoke about the kitchen for rental purposes? Please don't make it smaller than about 10 feet. So this is your kitchen design 101. Again, you can go as big as you want, um, but I wouldn't recommend going smaller than this. This is about 10 feet. The idea behind it is this. You open the fridge, you take your stuff out, you put it in the dirty area. So you need a little bit of a, a, little bit of a space. You need a cabinet, at least a 24-inch cabinet. You take that stuff, you put it in the sink, you wash it, you put it to the clean area. That's your preparation area. Then you cook it on the stove and you put it on the serving area. So you definitely, you can play with the size of the cabinets and the amount of the cabinets, but typically you want to make sure that you have a fridge space, sink space, stove space. And sometimes they get separated, but this is the basic idea of how to design a kitchen if the kitchen is linear. Also, try to avoid putting a stove next to the wall. That's why, again, even though that's a clean area, imagine if you're going to be cooking and hitting your elbows on the wall. Not so good. Same thing with a sink. Splatters, everything else. So you need to make sure there's clearance on all the sides. Tip number three, understand interior design style. So I'm no interior designer, so I'm not going to spend too much, too much time here, but there's tons of different designs. Before, once you understand what you want, once you understand what you need, once you understand your budgets, go take a look at Pinterest, go take a look at uh, websites of some of the contractors, take a look at Instagram, take a look at the stuff that you like. There's so many different styles and designs right now. Traditional design, mid-century modern, which came out basically mid-century, last century. Contemporary design. Contemporary design is very popular right now in Europe. Slowly, slowly coming into Canada, you're going to see it way more and more. Um, you're looking at a lot of use of uh, modern use of woodwork, stonework, concrete. So it's very plain, natural colors. Bohemian, very interesting design for some people as well. Farmhouse, coastal, minimalist. And I left one, don't listen to anyone and merge them all. In the end of the day, you have to love the basement. No one else has to love the basement unless you're selling it tomorrow. I've built basements that, frankly speaking, I personally don't like them, but it doesn't matter. I tell my clients, if you tell me to paint your ceiling red, I'll paint your ceiling red. It's not going to be a really popular option. Probably not going to be so good for resale, but I actually had an experience where I walked into the basement and the walls and the ceiling were red. So. We don't have to love it, you have to love it. This is just guidelines, and this will help you to navigate through the process. Once you understand what you like in terms of the design, make sure that once you find the contractor, you understand that that contractor actually can fulfill your wishes in terms of the design based on their standard pricing. If they can't, it's okay, but you just have to understand that. And you have to budget some extras for the upgrades if you want something that will fulfill that design. And again, that's going to go back to the budget, understanding what are the most valuable things that we can do considering your budgets. Number four, research types, research the types of materials and finishes. Um, we gathered some most popular questions that we get asked in regards to different types of materials, so let's go through them. Number one, what goes under my floor? Sort of a subfloor. There's a big misconception in terms of what subfloor means. Te technically speaking, anything that goes under the floor is a subfloor. But again, normally in the basement world, when you're talking about subfloor, you're talking about things like dry core. So by standard, with most contractors, if not all, you're going to get a regular underlayment underneath your floating floor. And different types of floors are going to have different types of underlayments. Laminates have its own. Vinyls have its own, carpets have its own. A lot of vinyls will actually come with the underpads attached to it as well. Um, I've seen some laminate products that have the underpads attached to them as well. At that point, you actually don't need to use anything else. Next step up would be a product DMX. I believe they actually have a booth here as well. Great product, love it. Um, it replaces your existing underlayment. Um, Unless, the, unless it's vinyl. So if it's vinyl, it has the underlayment attached to it, so you can't really take it out, so you're just going to have another layer of underlayment. Um, be careful, though, with vinyls. Uh, take a look at the manufacturer specifications. Some manufacturers will say, if you're putting anything 
below that underpad, it will void the warranty, it will void the manufacturing warranty. With some of them, it won't. So make sure that you do that research before you actually, uh, before you actually understand what to put under the floor or get some recommendations from the contractor. It will add a little bit of insulation, it will add a little, a little bit of heat. They do advertise R3. The R value is essentially the value of heat loss, how much heat you're going to be losing to the slab, to the concrete floor, to the cold floor. R value uh, 3.5 per inch. Having said that, the product is extremely thin, so the actual value is not our 3.5, it's way lower than that, but it does give you a little bit of that, uh, um, of, of that um, heat addition, so it does add a little bit of insulation. Also helps with the uneven floors. None of the basement floors in Canada are leveled. So when the builders pour the concrete, unfortunately the concrete has a tendency of settling differently in different areas. Um, and just because of that, so this, this product will help you to mitigate the unevenness of the floor. We'll talk about the uneven floors and what to do with it as well. Next level up would be Drycore and Drycore R+. Both great products. I actually will give you a spoiler alert. I recommend Drycore R+. Drycore R+, is uh, 20 to 25 percent more expensive. This stuff will go on the floor first. We recommend to screw it down. Then you put the underpad, then you put the floor. So it's not a replacement of the underlay, it's an addition too. So it's an optional product. Statistically from our basements, from our stats, we're looking at about 30% of the people going for the product. It's quite an expensive product. It will make a difference in terms of heat. Um, you're going to lose one inch of height. Um, Drycore will give you a value of R1.4, Drycore R plus R3. The reason why I love Drycore R plus is because only for 20-25% more, it will, it will double the insulation value, so you're actually going to start feeling the difference in terms of the heat and in terms of, um, in, in terms of the insulation. Remember, none of these are magical solutions. When you take a look at the walls, depending on when your house was built, if it's an, if it's, um, if it's an older house, you're probably going to have the blankets of R8 on the walls. The newer house, R20. So you're putting down R3, R1.4, maybe a little bit less even, on the floor. So it's not going to magically make your floors feel the same as upstairs. It's just going to feel a little bit better, a little bit more comfortable. There are some options with heated floors as well. They do cost quite a bit, but those are options too. Soundproofing. Again, clients ask, should I be doing soundproofing? The answer is it depends. Um, depends what you're going to be doing. If you're going to be doing a home theater, this probably doesn't apply to you just because you need to put a much higher level of soundproofing in the ceilings or the walls. There's different products. You can put acoustic drywall. You can put two layers of drywall. There's tons of different. You can build walls within walls, and, and there's different um, ways of doing that. For a majority of the clientele, people will be interested in safe and sound or resilient channels. So what do they do? Safe and sound is sort of that bad insulation you can see over there between the pieces of wood, between the joists. Um, it will muffle the sound transfer from basement to the main floor and from the main floor to the basement. Resilient channels, on the other hand, are those metal pieces that you can see over there. They get screwed to the joist, and when you screw the drywall, the actual bottom piece, it gets screwed to that channel. So effectively, you're minimizing the amount of transfer of vibration from the main floor to the basement. So effectively, your drywall is going to be hanging in the air, and the movement is going to be much more limited. If you're doing a legal basement apartment, we have to do both solutions. It's not a question of do we want to. It's very important. Because again, legal basement apartment, you're creating a separate living space. You want to make sure that it separates upstairs from the basement. Home theater, another great option, office space and furnace room. If you don't want to hear the furnace area, close it off. That will also help. It will make a difference, but it will not be completely soundproof. Your sound will still travel through the ducts. You can't avoid that. Otherwise, you have to create some very high-end HVAC solutions. It's possible, but it's, I haven't seen anyone implement it yet unless you're building a custom house from the scratch. What to put in the bathroom? There's three different types of things you can put in terms of bathtub, prefab shower, custom shower. Bathtub nowadays is probably the least popular option. 5% if not less of people put bathtubs when they put, when they put bathrooms um, in the basements. If you don't have a bathtub upstairs for resale, I do recommend to put a bathtub. It's one of the cheaper options. The reason why I say prefab shower potentially is a little bit more expensive is going to depend on the prefab shower unit. Unit like this will actually cost relatively the same as a bathtub. If you get into fancier units, it's going to cost a little bit more. I like the prefab shower for one reason. It's going to put a check mark uh, for resale value. It's not so great if you're going to be using the shower every single day. So the lifetime value and longevity of it is not so great. So if you're going to be using the shower every single day, 
please put some money and get a custom shower. It will last you way longer. In the end of the day, you're going to end up with a better product. Another big one, laminate versus vinyl. You see everyone putting vinyl everywhere. I have nothing against vinyl, great product. There are some differences between laminates and vinyls though. So let's go through laminate. Laminate is actually warmer. It has a little bit of a higher insulation value, especially if you go into technicalities. There's two types of vinyls. There's SPC, WPC. One is a stone composite, one is a wood composite. The WPC is a little bit warmer. Still, laminate is a little bit more insulated. Um, some are water-resistant laminates, some are not. They're not waterproof, but they will hold some water. Actually, I've got a product over there. I'll show you. We soaked the laminates for 24 hours. Some of them, the waterproof ones, we soaked, we soaked for over 72 hours in the water. We pulled them out, we let them dry, we take a look what's happening. We always test our products. We actually notice with bad quality laminates, yes, they're gonna expand. With good quality laminates, they're not gonna expand or they're not gonna expand so much. The idea behind it, if you have a flood, you're screwed either way. So you really have to be thinking of protecting from top down. So laminates, warmer, they're summer resistant, they're a little bit less expensive, they're slightly more prone to damage, but they're again, they're pretty damn, um, they're pretty damn durable. So actually at the booth, we use laminates. So um, it it's, it's depends on what you like. You need 12 millimeters of thickness, it's bigger clicks, it's not gonna break as much. Vinyls are colder, they are waterproof, they're more expensive, they're a little bit less prone to, to damage. Uh, they're small, smaller clicks, so if you have uneven floors, probably they're gonna break a little bit easier. Um, the looks on the laminates versus vinyls, actually, it's not so much seen over here, but you can see the texture. I have yet to see a vinyl that can replicate the wood really, really well. So it looks great, but just not as great as laminate. So again, we use both laminates or vinyls depending on our clients. I always say, let's say for personal use, if it's a newer house and it's not a walkout, I'll probably recommend laminate. I'll probably do that in my own basement. If it's a walkout, you're gonna be dripping water top down, use, use vinyl. If you're gonna be having kids um, uh, playing with toys, dropping things, maybe put vinyl. If you have a legal basement apartment, put vinyl, you don't control your tenants. Make sure you minimize the amount of damage you have to fix after they're, after they're gone if they need to leave. This was actually a video, it's not gonna play, but basically, long story short, we went, I, I went to inspect a 120 year old basement uh, after a flood. The vinyls, even though they don't absorb moisture, they actually change the texture so they become wobbly, so I was able to press on it and, and, it, and it basically warps up, so it doesn't absorb it, but it does change the texture. Tip number five, know where to spend and know where to save. So we came up with four main tips. Number one is make sure you split your wants and needs. Do you really need a sauna? Do you really need the accent wall? Once you understand where you can cut, and again, this is only relevant if, if the budgets are tight, but from our experience, statistically, probably 99.9% the budgets are always tight in terms of we, we, everyone wants to make sure that we're building a great basement for a certain cost and the people are trying to stick within that budget and it's quite understandable. That's why it's important to split the needs and the wants. Number two, spend money on the bones and save on cosmetics. What do I mean by that? If you want to put a subfloor, put a subfloor. You can't put it later. If you need soundproofing, put soundproofing. You can't put it later. If you want an accent wall just from tile, you can do that later. If you want a bar, rough in the bar, put the mechanical, don't put in the cabinets. You can save the cabinets, you can do that in a year, you can do that in two years. If you want an accent wall with a fireplace and stone, put the fireplace because you won't be able to do that afterwards. Don't put the stone, put the stone in a year, right? So make sure that you think in phases. This brings us to number three, don't think in sections, think in phases. My recommendation, don't do what some, con uh, what some, what some clients uh, make in terms of mistakes. Finish a section of the basement and then call the contractor to finish another section of the basement. It will probably cost you double to finish. No professional basement renovation company will come in to finish one room. It's just gonna cost you too much money. So if you want to save, kind of gonna bring, bring us to number four, some contractors will allow you to do some of the work yourself. And typically that'd be the work in the end, for example, painting. So the contractor will leave, they'll finish the priming, they'll finish the floors. Some contractors will even allow you to do sort of, um, we have an option where we do, we can stop at any stage. We don't want anyone before us, anyone after us, but we can stop at any stage. For example, we can stop before we start the trim work and before we start the flooring. You just have to understand what is going to be entailed in terms of you completing that work. For example, painting is not only rolling. Some clients think it's only rolling. So. Painting is also prep work. Painting is also putting caulking, minor touch-ups, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So 
even if you make that decision, be clear to understand exactly what does it mean to paint or what does it mean to do the things that you want to do and that, that you don't want the contractor to do. Number six, inspect existing basement conditions. Number one, I always say look for water. If you have insulation, um, you're probably going to see discoloration if there's any water. Um, typically also there's, there's companies that us or anyone else can invite and they can do crack injection but they can also inspect the space. So if it's a minor leak and if it's a poured concrete, so newer let's say subdivision houses, you can simply do an epoxy crack injection and, and, and that's it, you're fixed. It's a relatively inexpensive fix. If you have major issues then you're looking into waterproofing, either internal or external. There's two types. If you waterproof from the inside, it's much worse than from the outside. Why? The water still penetrates, it still deteriorates, your foundation is still sort of breaks down the foundation. If you waterproof from the outside, what's going to happen is you're, you're going to waterproof the perimeter and the water is not going to get in. So you're stopping, this, uh, you're stopping the water from coming inside of the house. So it's way better. It's much more expensive and sometimes actually the accessibility is tough. So depending on what you have on the outside of the house, sometimes there's porches, etc., etc. So sometimes that's tougher. Floor smoothing. Remember we spoke about the uneven floors and laying the floors. So. Us, let's say as a contractor, we come in at a certain stage and you see those orange marks. Um, our project manager or the tiler would do an inspection with a level, they do an inspection with a laser, they take a look at the uneven floors and then the tiler pours the concrete to make sure that we smooth out the floors. Um, if your floors are not even, you have chances of clicks breaking with vinyls and with laminates, typically with vinyls a little bit more with, than with laminates unless you get certain more flexible vinyls, but without, without getting technical you just need to get your floors fixed. Um, there is a more expensive solution is pouring your whole basement with self-leveling concrete, but it's quite expensive. This will get you probably 75 to 85% there for probably 30% of the cost. Still, 90% of the time, the clients want this. Not a lot of, not a lot of people want to pour the whole basement worth of concrete because we're going to have to find the toppest level of the top, the, 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 the highest point of the basement and pour the, honk, the whole concrete to, to that level. And typically, it's crazy expensive to do that. You can see over here, for example, see how much unevenness. That's actually a cap from the spray. So in some basements, you have over an inch gaps in some spaces. So we had to put a put bunch of concrete. And the older the house, the worse it gets, to be honest. This is an example of a very old house where we had to pour sand mix and then concrete in sections, and only then we had to put tiles. So sometimes it gets quite expensive. But again, it's still cheaper than pouring the whole basement with concrete. Electrical cleanup, plumbing cleanup, HVAC cleanup, structural cleanup. You're typically not going to encounter these in newer houses. Old houses, you will. You can take a look. Sometimes there's these were actually posts that these were not temporary. So we walked into the basement when the guys were doing underpinning. Um, these posts were there, and they're there to support some cut joists, some structural issues meaning we have to take them out, sister the joists. To sister the joists, you have to clean a bunch of electrical. Uh, this is actually our project manager taking the videos. Um, so there's sometimes old electrical wiring, old plumbing that we have to fix. There is sometimes structural things that we have to do. If you're doing underpinning, sometimes there's HVAC work that you have to do. If you have a radiator system, sometimes you have to move the radiator system, et cetera, et cetera. So there's, the older the house, the more preparation work you're going to need to do. And when you're getting a quote, be very careful. Since when you're going to get a quote, typically you're going to get a quote um, to finish the basement if your basement is ready to renovate. So imagine you're, you have a house, a two-year-old house in Richmond Hill, and that's, 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 the quote, that's what the quote is for. Typically, the preparation work would be extra, so, and we'll get to that as well, but make sure you understand what's, what's included in the quote. Number seven, understand the permitting process. And this is a very hurtful for, thing for me just because unfortunately in the industry, the industry has a really bad rep. I see tons of times when I walk into the client's homes and I'm like, well, you need to get a permit. And they're like, well, I have contractor X, Y, and Z. And they told me I don't need to get a permit. I'm like, yeah, you need to do it. And, and go to the website, go to Google, type in basement renovation or building permit in your municipality. And this is just a screenshot of Vaughn. But in reality, different municipalities will need different permits. Majority of them will need a, both a plumbing and a, a building permit. I know, for example, Aurora only needs a plumbing permit. But 99 times out of 100, you need to put, pull some sort of permit to, um, to, um, to finish the basement. If you walk on a street, unfortunately, 
the stats will say roughly probably 10, nine basements out of 10 are probably not going to be permitted. But that's a combination of multiple factors. The homeowners don't even know, the homeowners don't want to do it, the contractors don't tell them, or the contractors tell them, but the homeowners don't want to do it in the combination of these factors. But reality says, take a look at your municipal laws and the city bylaws, chances are you need to pull the permit and understand that. Again, a lot of clients will tell us, well, I probably need to only pull the permit if I'm finishing the basement for rental purposes. Again, no, for personal use, you still need to pull the permit. But if you're finishing a legal basement apartment, remember those costs that you saw, 40 to $70 a square foot? That price skyrockets way higher because there's so many extra things that we need to do. And this is sort of the list. Soundproofing, separate entrance, Egress, uh, so means means of escape, whether it's uh, a door, if it's on the same level, or a big window. And again, the window doesn't really have to be in the bathroom, sorry, in the bedroom. It can, it, it has it has to be just in the same level. You need to also comply with certain lighting requirements. So you might have to open up more windows. You'll need, on average, depending on municipality, it's a little bit different, but average rule of thumb, you need two and a half percent of the living space. Um, as a lighting requirement in a bedroom and 5% of the living room or vice versa. So effectively, let's say if you have 100 square feet of space, if you need 5%, you need 5 square feet of glass, natural light coming in. So if you don't have enough windows, we'll have to open up more windows. Potential sprinkler work, um, not often, there's only a couple municipalities, Brampton for example. Duck mounted smoke de de detectors, fire dampers in the, uh, in the, in the, um, um, in the actual vents. So the idea behind it is you need to completely separate the basement from the main floor. Um, so you're basically creating a duplex uh, and there's a complete separation with fire as well as sound from the basement to the main floor. You'll also need to upgrade your electrical panel to 200 amp if you need, if, if your um, amp is, sorry, if your panel is 100 amps or 125 amps or 150 amps, you'll need to upgrade that. <clears throat> Number eight, be prepared for difficulties. Again, this is more for older houses, and if you get a good contractor, those are really not difficulties. They're just some hurdles that you need to overcome. But I'll just show you one of the projects, a more difficult project. It's a little bit tough to see, but one of the solutions sometimes that we offer is actually a complete slab removal and repouring of the slab. And what does that allow? If your floors are really uneven, if your drains are really old, chances are your drains need to go and change. Chance, if you don't have waterproofing, chances you have moisture coming in. So we say, okay, how about we just remove the slab, put all the new drains, put the drains and the rough-ins in the right locations exactly where you want them, so now you can put the bathrooms and the laundries wherever you want without any extra relocation costs. Also, put waterproofing on the exterior perimeter. And once that's done, pour the concrete, so then at the end of the day, you have a level slab or at least some much more level slab. <clears throat> you have new drains, you have waterproofing, sub pumps, you have backwater valves, and all of those things. So this at the top left was actually taken um, during that excavation period. And you can see how much there's stuff hanging, so there's structural issues. This, this is actually waterproofing on the perimeter. And this is where the concrete was already poured. And now that's actually a picture, so we're finishing that project off right now. So I just pulled it yesterday from our project management software. And this is what it looks like now. So going from that to this. And sometimes with these older homes, it doesn't need to be Taj Mahal. It doesn't need to be a super extravagant basement. The actual hard labor goes behind the walls. It goes into the actual preparation of the space. Same project, this is what the space used to look like, and this is the bathroom that we placed in that area. There used to be actually a window. We took the window out, we blocked it off because the window was under the porch, it's not getting any light, it's useless window. We block it off, we build the bathroom. So <clears throat> sometimes you run again into issues with, with clearances. Over here, see it was highlighted, that clearance of the hallway was extremely small. So. And that's a waterproofing membrane, which you can't penetrate when you're building the wall. So we had to come up with really, really creative ways of framing to make sure that we, to make sure that we finish it. And it does cost a little bit extra to the client, but it's, it's impossible to go around it. So once we finished it, it looks like this. So again, if you have an older home especially, be prepared for the difficulties. In newer houses, not so much. It's actually a piece of cake. The only difficulties will be in the finishing. Uh, if you want some fancy cabinetry work or mill work, that's where the custom um, work and a little bit of difficulties might, might come in. But otherwise, majority of the difficulties come to the older homes. Number nine, plan, plan your renovation timing. We don't finish basements in three weeks, <coughs> or at least we don't want to cut corners. 
We don't sacrifice speed for quality. Um, it's very important. Again, there's some contractors that would really finish it in two weeks or three weeks. We can finish it in three weeks if it's a 600 square foot open concept area, but majority of the basements, it will take about six weeks to finish it. Think on top of the six weeks to finish it. Um, you also need to get the permit. If you need to get the permit, if let's say we start working on the permit today, city websites will say about 10 business days. In reality, you're looking at the whole process. I've seen anything as quick as three days, but I've seen it only once in my lifetime, and I've seen it as slow as three months. On average, you're looking at about two, two and a half months to get the permit um, for, for the basement renovation. So imagine six weeks, which is basically a month and a half, two and a half months, that's what's four months. So I recommend start planning your basement renovation at least three months from the completion date. Let's say if you want to complete it in three months, you have to sign the contract today. Or if you need it in three months, sometimes you need to sign a contract three months ago. So depending on the complexity of the project, depending on the size of the project, depending on the permits that you're going to do, the length is going to change. So make sure that you're also realistic. Make sure whenever someone is coming in and saying, we're going to finish your basement until the end of the month, there's probably something hiding there. So make sure that you, you, you watch out for that. Number 10, find the right contractor. And this is probably a very simple one, but there's a couple of things that I like to, to point out. Number one is, of course, are they licensed? Are they insured? Do they have WSAB, et cetera, et cetera. Number two, check reviews. And I always say, focus on the bad ones. It's very hard to get a good review from a good client, actually. But statistically, it's very easy to get a bad review from a bad client. And construction is really not about problems happening. Problems will happen. It's about how the company will deal with those problems. So take a look at the bad reviews. Take a look if there's any bad reviews. If there's none, great. If there's some bad reviews, what does that review say? And sometimes, to be honest, the bad review is not a problem. Sometimes the client is very difficult. There's bad contractors. There's also bad clients. Um, but again, make sure that you, that you do your, re your research. When comparing quotes, these are probably notoriously the main, the main things that could be different between the contractors. Check the electrical scope of work. There is a lot of contractors that will underestimate the amount of electrical points do you need, the amount of pot layers do you need. I've seen as low as three points, meaning um, three electrical points, one switch, one plug, one light per 100 square feet. If you're putting pot lights, you're going to need like three and a half pot lights only, no switches, no plugs, nothing for that particular space. If you have a room, let's say a 100 square foot room, you're going to need four plugs. If you want pot lights, you need four pot lights, so that's eight, and you'll need a switch, so that's nine versus three. And if every pot light or switch or plug costs 100 bucks a pop, you're looking at $900 difference right there. So a lot of people will miss that. Uh, plumbing relocation, floor smoothing, the prep work. So make sure you understand what's included, what's not included. Something that also didn't include there, understand what features and what finishes go into the basement renovation. Some, some clients get caught in that as well. Understand what's not included and beware of cost. If something is not included, it's okay. It's also important, it's just important for the contractor to be transparent and say what's included and say what's not included. We always have a slide saying, hey, before we do the quote, this is what's not included in the quote. Um, sometimes if someone doesn't say it's not included, read the contract, read the fine print, make sure they understand what you're signing and who you're working with. Evaluate the presentation. So that first impression is very important because probably that first impression is going to represent how they're going to be building the basement as well. Some companies, having said, they'll focus a lot on sales and not so much on production. Some companies will focus way more on production, not so much on sales. So this is not perfect math, but I definitely say first impression is quite important. Number six, evaluate speed of quote delivery. I always say a professional contractor should be able to deliver a quote on the same day, probably at the same time. If not, why are you doing your calculations? You probably don't have the math. You probably don't know the numbers. So I always say, make sure that you get the quote on the same day. If you're not, that also will sometimes, if you have to wait for a week, they'll probably reflect how they're doing the project management as well. Understand the contractor's process, the pre-construction, the during construction, the post-construction, the things they're going to be doing. Also understand, do they have any project management platforms? How do they manage their, their, their jobs? Like how many jobs do they run? And based on how many jobs do they run, how do they track it? Do they do this on paper? Do they do this in Excel? There's tons of softwares right now. Build a Trend, Co-Construct, Procore, Microsoft Project. I can keep on going. So there's tons of tools right now to help the builders and the contractors to manage. And also, a lot of those tools will have a client portal. So good contractors 
will actually give you access to the portal where you can see what's happening on your site and when things are done. If they're not sharing it, again, question mark. Bonus tip, be a good client. And I say this from my heart because from my experience, if you hire a good contractor, and there's a couple of basement renovation companies in, in, in here, and they're all great, but 90% uh, of your success at that point comes down to you. Um, respect your contractor. Most of them are good guys. I know some of them are not great, and I know there's some horror stories, but most of the contractors are good, and they're trying to make you happy. So respect them, and they will try to make you even happier. Number two, pay on time and be proactive. So don't wait for the, for the contractor to come to you. Don't wait for the contractor to send you sort of a request and to chase you down. You probably have a payment breakdown on when everything is due. So pay contractors, they will definitely respect that. And once they respect that, once you see that you're a great client, I know this from our business. When we have clients coming to us and we're saying, hey, Alex, you know, we owe you money. We are really happy. We want to make them even happier. Respect the contractor pricing. We understand that the basement renovations are expensive. So sometimes clients will request a pricing, contractor will send the pricing back, and the client say, hey, why is it so expensive? Can we make it cheaper, et cetera, et cetera. They probably gave you a pricing for a reason because of certain margins, certain costs, et cetera, et cetera. So respect their pricing. There's always an option of choosing the other contractor, not taking on the job or not taking something on. Um, don't argue with it. Um, of course, there's ways to get some discounts. Sometimes there's certain seasonal discounts. Um, also, by the way, don't be trapped into ongoing discounts because it's just an overinflated price with a discount all year long. Um, make sure that you don't make any changes after the start of the project. This is actually the biggest one. So <clears throat> a good contractor is going to have a good pre-construction process in terms of project management meetings, design meetings, layout meetings with the designers, project managers, project coordinators, you name it. Once those are done, there's a certain package of documents that get put together. It gets sent out to all the trades. It gets sent out to all the project managers. All the materials start getting delivered. If you start making changes after the project is started, you're putting more and more and more points into potential screw-up from someone else. So the less changes you do mid-project, the better. This is the same thing when you're building a house. There's certain deadlines, and after that, that's it. Good contractors, like for example, if you come to us and you say, hey Alex, change my paint color. If we didn't buy your paint, we're going to change your paint color. That's not a problem. But try to avoid that as much as possible. Number five, make sure you communicate any changes in writing. Trust me, you're going to call a contractor, he has 25,000 things going on. You tell him something, maybe he didn't understand you, you didn't understand him or her. Um, he then gets a phone call from another job site, there's an emergency, there's an issue, he probably forgot everything that, was the, that the conversation was about. So <clears throat> if it's not in writing, it didn't happen. Put everything in writing, that's a pro tip. And leave a positive review if you like the job. That will definitely help the business grow, that would definitely help um, everything else grow, that would definitely help everyone. And that's pretty much it. Thank you for your time, guys. And if you have any more questions, our booth is 1501. I'm going to stick around for a couple more minutes. If you have any questions in regards to the basement renos, more than happy to answer. Yes. Oh, I can is run there, out. Uh, I, I, I there can run go. out. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Yes, sir. Oh, thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, usually, renovate the basement. Uh, how many payment we can like, uh, not pay one time, right? Maybe yeah, can we course. make a five payments or ten payments? <coughs> usually, what's the normal? Ten is a little bit too much. Five is just the right amount. So again, every contract is going to work differently. I can only speak for us. With us, there is a very small deposit. We charge like two thousand dollars plus HST just on, on a signing. This is just a contractual agreement, and then it's typically um, broken down into thirty, 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 ten. So that's for us. Some contractors split it differently. Having said that, be careful. Some contractors. There's a rule, there's a law in Canada saying you need to withhold 10% of the payment until the job is complete. And when the job is complete, also there's a trick to that, meaning 2% of the value of that job um, should be left only, let's say there's $300 worth of touch-ups on the walls. That doesn't withhold the 10%. But there's a major thing, it withholds 10%. Some contractors will say 10% of labor left until the end. They actually can't legally do that. You can, you, can, you can try to fight that. But normally they'll break it down into your four or three payments depending on, 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 on the timing. 10 payments is just too much to manage. 
two payments is too big because typically, let's say the average basement renovation, you're probably looking at sixty, seventy thousand dollars nowadays um, after you put all the things that people put in. So five payments, but there's two small ones, three big ones. Fantastic. Do, do we have any questions immediately right now? Because I have a question for you. I'd say that was an amazing presentation, and I think Alex deserves a big round of applause from you guys. Give it up for hey. Alex Patsula. Thank you very much, Alex. Thank that was you fantastic. Guys. I can't believe Reno Duck left. I was going to get my picture with Reno Duck. So you your should booth, come to the booth. Yes, yeah, go we'll to the booth. The 1501, you can get your picture with Reno Duck. And you've got another presentation. You're doing this again on Monday, on aren't Monday, you? On Monday, yeah. On Monday. So if you guys want to, come back and check him, check him out. We've got all sorts of presentations all week. Another round of applause for Alex Patsula right there. Thank you, guys. And Reno Duck, the fastest growing basement renovation company in all of the GTA. Uh, that concludes our presentations here at the HGDT.